everybody. Welcome back to the Compass Church. I am so grateful to be with all of you who are participating online. Thinking of you folks down at the Bolingbrook campus, South Naperville, love you, Wheaton, Naperville. Uh, welcome to our new series entitled The Wonder of Christmas. You know, I am presently in one of the many closets and storage rooms that we keep at the church, Christmas decor. And that's what you do, you know, that day after Thanksgiving, that marks the official beginning of the Christmas season. And we all in our homes and at church, we climb into those closets and pull out the decorations and start the music and start to enjoy the wonder of it all. You know what the wonder of Christmas is. I know you do. We have all tasted it, that magic that you feel when the music starts playing when the lights start glistening, when the smiles and excitement in the children starts abounding. Is the wonder of Christmas caught up in the decorations and all the lights? Some would say yes. We Christians would say that's a wonder, but there's a deeper wonder. We try to press beyond just all of the glitz and glamour, and we press into the manger. We know that at its core, Christmas is a celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ. And we don't want to miss that. We want our joy, our highest Christmas joy, to be caught up in Jesus. But I argue now, we're going to press into an even deeper wonder. You say, deeper than Jesus? Well, no. But deeper aspects of the birth of Christ. Typically, we Christians, we turn to the Gospels of Matthew or Luke. They're the ones that have all the details about the historical record of the birth narrative. You know, the angels and the wise men and Herod and the shepherds, Mary and Joseph. We're not going to Matthew or Luke. That's what I normally do. We're going to John. The Gospel of John is radically different. Friends, this new series, The Wonder of Christmas, is a four-week study of the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John. It's, it's called the prologue to the Gospel of John. John knows that his buddies, Matthew and Luke, have already given the details surrounding the historical events. John wants to give us a spiritual look at the birth of Christ, the Incarnation. John wants us to wonder at the implications of what happened historically. And so it's very theological, very practical, very transformative, and I can't wait to study it with you. Week one is called, He is the Word. I'm going to start in the middle of this 18 verse prologue with verse 14. What a great verse. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Friends, that's Christmas. You know, isn't it about a baby being born in a place in a manger? Yes, it is that on the visible front. But spiritually, it is the word, the second person of the Trinity, God, becoming flesh, becoming a human being and making his dwelling, his home, among us for 33 years. The mind-boggling spiritual truth behind the celebration of Christmas is that God visited the planet he made, became one of the creatures he made, lived among them with a very profound objective of saving them. And so we celebrate that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The only thing that bothered me about that, I love that verse for a long time, but I never liked the word. What's that all about? Can't you say Jesus or Christ became flesh and made his dwelling among us? The word. You know, I, I was bothered because I didn't understand the contextual significance of the logos. That's the Greek word for word. And as I've studied and learned, I am so excited to share with you that in John's day, the term logos was wildly popular, hugely popular among philosophers. You know, the ancient Greek philosophers were really big into the concept of the logos. It had actually been introduced in like 500 BC. 
But in John's day, there was a Jewish philosopher by the name of Philo, and Philo was very popular. In fact, we have many of his writings still today. He was a contemporary of Jesus and the apostles, and he wrote about the Logos. In fact, 1,300 times in his writings, we find the concept of the Logos. And here's what he said. He said, the Logos, and the ancient Greek philosophers said this as well, is the intelligence. That's what, you know, word is a concept of knowledge that is communicated. So it's the intelligence behind the brilliance of creation. You know, these philosophers, uh, ancient Greeks as well as Philos, they were scientists in part. They were studying the physical world and the details of it and seeking to provide explanations for why it is what it is. And some of them, they looked and they just saw, man, our world, whether it be within the human body or out in outer space, there is an order, there is a stability, there is a balance, a complexity, an efficiency, a mathematical consistency within the laws of nature, a beauty that we see in what is seen and in song, and there's a morality that must be, and all of these details that made them just astounded led to the conclusion there must be an intelligence. You know, the ancient Greeks, they were like, yeah, many of the philosophers rejected the Greek pantheon of Zeus and all his friends. They're like, yeah, I'm not buying that. But I know it cannot be chance and time. There must be an intelligence. It must be the logos. And so even secular Jews celebrated the logos that was out there. So John got that term from secular philosophy, but he also got the term from the theologians, the biblical scholars of the day. They were looking at the Old Testament and they were mesmerized by a term that they used. They used an Aramaic term called memra. And they found that in the Old Testament, 119 times, there's the memra phrase, and that is the word of the Lord appeared to so-and-so. We see it appeared to Ezekiel and Jeremiah and David and Samuel. I could go on and on. And, and they were like, wow, there's really a concept here, the word of the Lord. And as they studied it, they, they came to some interesting conclusions. They said, and in some ways, the word of the Lord is God, but in other ways, there's a distinct personality from God. I mean, the word of the Lord, it sometimes says it stood among them or it brought them to a certain place. And there's like, man, there's an, a personality, a manifestation of God that in some ways is God, but in another way is distinct from God. And they were even concluding that there, were, there was a complexity to their monotheism. The, these Jews were like, no, we, are, we only believe in one God. But they were acknowledging from the Old Testament record that there was a complexity to God. Even in the creation narrative, they saw that God says, let us make mankind in our image, plurality there. And they saw that God, you know, would speak and that the word of God is what brought creation into being. He said, and, and it was so. And so there was a real excitement in the first century surrounding the, the memra, this, the word of the Lord. And John's like, bingo. I got my Jews so excited about the, the word of the Lord, the agency of God, the distinctness yet oneness with God. And I got the secular philosophers all excited about the logos. He says, you know, you people, your, your supreme ideal that you're so jazzed about, the word, let me introduce you to the word. His name is Jesus. So now let's get to know that baby, the word lying in a manger, shall we? And John helps us understand who he really is with the first verses of his prologue. So now we're going to John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Wow! 
Uh, see what I mean? I mean, this is deep stuff. This is not a shepherds came to the manger type of thing. This is pressing on with a, a spiritual understanding of the true identity of the Christ child. And it's very p- powerful. It says what? In the beginning was the word. One of the great dangers as we look at baby Jesus is to assume that that's the beginning. Well, it's not the beginning for him. It's the beginning of his human life, but it's not the beginning of his existence. This reference to in the beginning Jesus was is a pointing back to eternity past. Friends, Christ is eternally pre-existent. Isn't that amazing? You know, unlike us, you know, we all have a start. Jesus has no start. He forever was. Makes him extremely different from us. In fact, a lot of the themes we see here is just how different he is from us. Not only is he eternal, but let me highlight this. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. (laughs) Friends, these are complex, but beautiful words describing the Trinity, pointing to the essence of God being one, but God being community in one. What do we see? We see that the Word, or Christ, is God. Uh, just flat out says that uh, the, the amazing thing about Christmas is God is being born on our planet. Jesus is God. And yet it also says Jesus was with God. In one way you can say He is God. In another way you can say they're together. And this is the essence of the Trinity. We, we discover later on more fully that there is one God, monotheistic religion, Christianity is, but that there are three persons within the one God, that there is community within God's complex being. And so this one born Christ on Christmas in Bethlehem, He is the second, is what theologians have called it, the second person of the Trinity. He is God, and he is wonderfully with and community God the Father. And so we see that this one born who looks very much like any other human is very much different from every other human. He is eternal. He is divine. But there's more. It says, he was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made. Through him all things were made. He's the creator. He's the one who made the universe, the world, us. You know, when you go back, well before Christmas, back to the beginning of the universe, there was Jesus in his pre-incarnate, wasn't a human being yet, but pre-incarnate identity Christ was instrumental in the creation of all. He created all. Once again, very different from us. Have you created a world? You're like, well, I've drawn some pictures and I made a shelf or did something. Yeah, we we are creators in small ways and he is the creator in the ultimate way. Jesus Christ made everything that there is. If uh, he made everything that there is, that means... Before he made anything, there was nothing but him. Friends, he is the uncreated creator. As part of the Godhead, we see that Christ is so different. We are created beings. Christ is uncreated. The only thing in the universe that's not created is God, his triune being. Everything else is brought about by him. And so... When you look at the baby in the manger, it's hard, is it not, to get your mind around who it is that you're looking at. But he is the eternal, uh, divine, uncreated creator, king of the universe, lying there in this human package. It's just absolutely mind-boggling who Jesus Christ is. You know, when we talk in the terms of these first three verses of John 1, It speaks of the transcendence of Christ. Do you know transcendence? That means that he's so far above us. He's so far beyond us that comparing us to him is laughable. 
because he's of a whole nother magnitude, uncreated creator of all, the God of the universe, transcendent. In fact, the word, the term word, speaks to that. It reminds us that he spoke and brought all that there is into existence. Word reminds us of the transcendence of, of Christ. But Christ isn't just transcendent. You know, some people in their theological or religious mindset, they view God as so distant and uninvolved, untouchable because of him being so exalted and above us. But he's not just transcendent, is he? He's also imminent. The word imminent means close. Jesus is both transcendent and imminent. And the term word speaks to both. Word reminds us that he's creator and transcendent, but word also reminds us of his imminence, that he's come close. Here's what I mean. The term word also conveys communication, does it not? And I don't know if you've thought about it, but communication is one being wanting to connect with another being. That's what communication is. The truth is without communication, without a word, the one being is all bottled up inside and we never really get a glimpse into that person. My wife sometimes has looked at me thinking I'm deep in thought and she has said, penny for your thoughts. A little saying that means, please, I'll pay you to tell me what you're thinking. She's always disappointed, you know, it's always like, ah, breakfast, that's what I was thinking about, you know. But what she's getting at is you're living inside of yourself. I can tell something's going on, but it's, I can't reach it. But if you'll speak, if you'll tell me with a word, what's inside and invisible becomes accessible to another. Our God could have been a transcendent God who is distant and away and doesn't want to connect with us or reveal himself. But that is not so. He is the God of the word. He is a God who has spoken, who has revealed his heart and sought to connect with us. And the greatest avenue, there's been many avenues throughout biblical history and beyond, but the greatest avenue of God speaking is the person of Jesus Christ. In Christ, we see God say, I have given you my word. And in Christ, we see the heart of God on display. We see the mission of God revealed. We see what God wants with us expressed. Oh, Jesus, not only is transcendent the word who created all, but he's the word that is drawn near and reaches out to us. In fact, let me go back to verse 14 again. This is what we started with. But the word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. You see the desire of God to say, I'm not just transcendent, I am also imminent. I want to be near you. I want to connect with you. I want relationship with you. Christ's whole mission coming to die on the cross was to establish relationship with a transcendent God. So in the term word, we see this collision of transcendence and imminence. We see this diametrically opposed yet beautifully fused duality to the nature of Jesus that he is the transcendent God that we just can't even wrap our minds around because he's so other and above us. But he's also the God who has drawn near and says, I have come to be with you and to know you, to have friendship with you. And so, I don't know about you, but I am learning to celebrate this wonderful intersection of transcendence and imminence in the person of Jesus Christ. To be close and connecting with one who's so infinitely above us, what a privilege that is. You know, this whole idea reminds me of uh, this particular ornament. You know, we're in the season of decorating our tree and putting up our ornaments, and Jen's got a story for every one of them. And this one is really special. It says on the back, Matt Singletary, 1994. Back in 94, Jen was a first grade teacher at the elementary school. And Matt was one of the students in her class. And Matt's dad was Mike Singletary. I know I gotta go back in time for some of you young people, but Mike Singletary was amazing. One of the 
Chicago Bears that won the Super Bowl. They called him Samurai Mike. He had just this intensity, like, I'm just going to flatten you. And he would, man, boom, he would take down those guys with the ball like that. He was one of my heroes. I loved Mike Singletary. That guy had an amazing career, one of the best Bears ever, Hall of Famer. Well, anyways, there was a day when my wife said, hey, hon, I'm having a meet the teacher night at school where all the parents and the kids can come and meet the teacher. She says, I think it'd be nice if you came. And at first I was like, no, they don't want to meet the teacher's husband. That's just weird. They, 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 kids don't believe teachers have husbands. You know what I mean? Uh, and she's like, no, no, I want you to come. And I was like, oh, I don't want to. She said, Mike Singletary will be there. Hun, I want to be there for you. You know, you're my wife and I want to support you. And so... I went and I had a great time. I was meeting various parents and I'll never forget I turned and there was Samurai Mike standing right in front of me wanting to meet me. It was the weirdest thing. He was like, Mr. Griffin, so you're the husband of the famous teacher, Mrs. Griffin. I'm like, uh-huh. And he said, I hear you're a pastor. He says, my dad was a pastor. Tell me about how you like being a preacher. I don't know what happened. I couldn't talk right. It was like I was so flustered and so overwhelmed that I was standing and staring into the eyes of Samurai Mike that I just got flustered. I, I, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm a pastor. I'm a pastor. Uh, Jen's my wife, and you're, I like the Bears. I'm a Bears fan, you know, and I just made a fool of myself. It was crazy. You may be aware of the dynamic. Sometimes it's called being starstruck. I think that's what's being described here in the scriptures. When you get somebody who in some ways is so far above us, and that's how I felt about Mike Singletary at that time. I mean, he was a multi-gajillionaire, famous celebrity star, Hall of Famer. I was just a young, newly married kid. So far above me, and yet here we are connecting in conversation. It was, there's a disequilibrium with being starstruck in a moment like that. It's weird. It's wonderful. Do you ever get starstruck with God? You know, we should. We should. We should be amazed with this intersection of transcendence and imminence. There should be a sense in which we're like, I can't believe who I'm talking to. I can't believe whose attention I have. As we turn in prayer to talk to the Lord, we should get starstruck. We should realize this should not be happening, but it is. The great I am, the creator, the eternal being has come into this room and is before me and wants to talk with me and be with me. All the glory of what is conveyed in Christ being the word, creator, word, creator, transcendent, and word, imminent, wanting to communicate with us. Friends, the message here is that we need to live every day moved by this opportunity to interact with the transcendent Christ. We need to be blown away by the privilege of building a friendship. You know, it's not a one-time thing like it was with Mike Singletary and I. It's an everyday thing. I wonder if you're working hard to build your friendship with God. I'm, of all the things you can do with your life, I'm telling you the most important is investing your days in the deepening and strengthening of the friendship with our maker. One of the ways we do that is through prayer and Bible study. In fact, we've tried to emphasize this by reminding everybody that we have four priorities in our church. Pursue, connect, serve, reach. Pursue, connect, serve, reach. Pursue him daily, connect in a group, serve on a team, and reach your neighbor. Let me just focus on the uh, pursue him daily. This focuses on having a little bit of time every day to read the Bible, because God speaks to you through his book, and to speak to the Lord in prayer. And I challenge you, if you're not doing it, fight to establish that habit. Maybe it's just five minutes, ten minutes at first. But get that alone time with God, because it's foundational to that relationship. 
That said, I don't want to overemphasize that 10 minutes each day with the Lord as if that's our only chance to have this transcendence intersect with his imminence. Uh, you can have those opportunities throughout your day. I'll, my son Jake has been teasing me lately. Uh, Jake will say, I, apparently, I don't realize I do this, but sometimes I make faces. I'll be sitting there and I'll just kind of look up and I am having a chance of communication with the Lord, and I think Jake knows that, so he shouts, Oh, Dad's having a moment! Look out, family, everybody back off! Pastor's having a moment! He has a good time teasing me there. But he's right, I, I do find moments throughout my day that can become glorious as I just think about the Lord's nearness, His love, or sense His voice, His word coming to me in my heart. Can I challenge all of us? Let's find more moments. They can happen throughout our day, driving to work, in the shower, as you lay down at night, as you're having a meal, as you're walking down the hall. This life can be filled with moments of relational development through intentional prayer, acknowledgement of God's nearness, His goodness, His love, His attention, where you share your heart, where you celebrate something he's teaching you. The more we fill our days with moments, the more rich that relationship will be and the more life we will have in him. I'll give you one last example. Uh, it's not something I was real happy about, but uh, I've shared with you that my mother-in-law had a fall and a resulting brain injury. And as a result, she has been unable to care for her dog. Well, guess who's caring for the dog as she's recuperating? That would be our family. I'm not a dog person. My other parts of the family are very excited about this. I'm not. But I will now acknowledge this one benefit. I, uh, Wrigley is his name. Wrigley has forced me to take more walks. We've got a little county forest preserve right by our house a beautiful wood path wooded path and i've been taking wrigley on these walks and as i take him on these walks i'm having moments and incredible moments this fall the colors did you know the leaves change color <laughs> i never knew it like i knew it this fall i've been spending more time praising god for the beauty of his creative landscape noticing details of trees and plants and animals and just talking with him as I walk and connecting with the Lord in a new way. You know, normally it's at a desk. My moment, big time with God, is with the Bible and my prayer journal. But I am experiencing a different type of moment with God out and about on those walks. And I'm realizing that I want diversity in the type of interaction I have with God throughout my day. Because with more forms of connection with him, the richer our friendship will become. Friends, you got one life. There's a lot you can do with it. The most important thing is to connect with the God who made you in a relational capacity. Build a friendship with Jesus. It will change everything. In fact, let me pray for us all towards that end. Lord, uh, this is kind of weird. We're uh, together with these people, that is. We're all praying to you from different locations. And yet, Lord, you are with us all. Jesus Christ, the Christmas child, is in the room with us now. And we say hello. And we say, it's good to be with you. And we say, we love you, Lord. Not as we ought, but we love you some, and we want to love you more. Lord Jesus, you, you showed us with your birth that you, though transcendent, are also imminent in wanting to draw close. And we say, yes, we want that too. Lord, please help each of us to press into conscious awareness of your nearness. Please, Lord, open the eyes of our soul to sense your presence. Let it freak us out a little, Lord. Let us sense your voice speak into our hearts. Let us sense your love. Lord, I know every single human being was made for you and will be miserable until they find true joy 
in knowing you. So help us deeply know you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.